You must be really excited to get to this episode, XO. Welcome to Yelling at Gaseous Anomalies, uh, everyone. Uh, tonight, we have a very special, excited time because it sounds like uh, Mike is really excited to get into oh, our favorite episode tonight. How you doing, Mike? <laughs> um, fine. Well, tonight we're talking about Tomorrow is Yesterday from the original series of Star Trek. Again, uh, Matt Ross, accompanied by my XO, uh, Mike Pontone. So, Mike, uh, I'm just going to, you know, I pause it here because we've got a lot of new viewers. We've got a lot yes, more hi, new everyone. Uh, viewers and listeners. We really appreciate it, and I imagine that a lot of these folks are TOS fans. Well, I hope so. So I understand that they're a lot probably like my Captain Matt Ross here, who knows ahead of time what I'm walking into. And Captain, <laughs> just like sending a fictional Geordi into a Jeffrey's tube that he knows is going to blow up and kill him, but is for the good of the ship. The greater good. The greater good. Sends me into episodes like this, knowing that they're turkeys... Knowing that they make Kirk look like a f- madman, and yet, so Matt, uh, Captain, when you know, okay, next week, this episode, XO number one, what's going through your head? Well, you did say you didn't want to know anything and wanted to be untainted, so, well, here you go. When I saw this episode coming up, even though I knew it was coming up, surprisingly, I almost memorized the entire original series, I was just waiting to hear you complain. Because I knew that's what it was going to be. This is not one of the better episodes. Tomorrow was yesterday. Although it is kind of a little fun in a silly kind of way. It's one of DC Fontana's. In fact, it is DC Fontana, uh, Fontana's very first fully credited things that she's done. So it's noteworthy for that. It's got a couple of noteworthy items in it. Sure. It does. And I'm going to get into it. I'm just going to say, here's the thing. I don't I realize I don't like bad media there are like people who are who enjoy bad movies and you know turkeys and they think oh it's so much fun and they're gonna go and like watch a midnight showing of the room My. or something like that or like neil breen movies and i'm like no i don't want to i can feel my life slipping away i want good stuff well that's true i this i mean this is like a bridge until next week's episode but this episode is a time travel episode, in case you couldn't tell from the title of the episode. I told you that last time, but before we go much further, let's read the December 28, 1966 press release, unless you got your own thing. Let's. But it says... No, no. Go ahead, Captain. A malfunction causes USS Enterprise to be returned in time to the late 1960s and into Earth orbit, where it is sighted by, as a UFO by a U.S. Air Force jet in... Tomorrow is yesterday on NBC television network, color cast of Star Trek. This was from January 26, 1967. Starts off with a lot of cool stock footage. Got to tell you that. Great stock footage. I'd rather look at vegetable stock. Yeah. Yes, it is, it is amazing to think that this is 60 years ago. Well, those are, you know, at least. Those are United States Air Force F-104s, so, uh, whee! Yes. No, that's what I was about to say. That That was 60 years ago. And that is what, about 60 years after the Wright Brothers? Yes. And we went from a little tiny flying kite to something that can break the sound barrier. That's true. Yes, pretty amazing. But you know what's really uh, bizarre on this is that, it or not bizarre, it's it was feeding into the UFO frenzy at the time. Not only did you have the space oh, race. Oh, I didn't even think about that's that. That's right. Yeah. UFO frenzy. Um, there's the time travel aspect, which is a time honored science fiction thing. It was notable for DC Fontana. She actually quit being Gene Roddenberry's secretary and became a full time writer. And I actually mi- Good for her. misdirected you. Yes, yeah, she used DC to not draw attention to the fact that she was a woman. I told you that. I mm-hmm. didn't want to really draw attention to that earlier on. But she became one of the more prolific writers and producers of this series and many other things. Uh, in science fiction, even animated movie, uh, TV shows into the 80s and 90s, like uh, Beast Wars, and among other things. Um, so she was in yeah, Beast Wars by the Transformers, more than meets the eye. Uh, this was her own draft. Uh, it was She had four drafts. Gene Kuhn added in some of the humor with the conversations there. 
Bob Josman wrote a memo saying that he thought he came up with this idea of a time traveling enterprise, so he wanted credit, so there caused a little kerfuffle between everyone. But no, DC got the full credit and all the money. But uh, yeah, this is a kind of a weird story. They go back in time. They're seen by an F one hundred four jet. Yeah. Yeah. This is. Uh, yeah. It's not too good. I'll tell you what I okay, like. Okay, tell me what you like, because it's not really a long episode, even though it's still 45 minutes. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's amazing. I, I have commented on this before, that there are some episodes that are amazingly written. Every five minutes, something new happens. It really expands the, the depths of your imagination, and it shows you how much narrative you can fit into 45 minutes. And then there are episodes like this, where it's like, oh my God, how can 45 minutes, oh, very so? how can so little happen over the course of 45 minutes. Um, so what I liked, something that I've not seen before and actually have not seen very much in Trek since, um, the uh, a Federation spaceship in orbit, in the atmosphere rather, with in the blue sky with clouds, and honestly, I thought it looked beautiful. I don't know if this is a retouched version, but it's gorgeous. Yes, that's... That's the remastered version, but even the original version, it looks pretty cool. Uh, you do see the Enterprise in the view of the uh, the in- fighter interceptor chasing it, but like uh, it is kind of uh, uh, neat the way they do that. You have the little tiny interceptor gaining ground on the gigantic Enterprise, going, "What in goodness names is that?" Well, it was very it was it was depleted, right? It was uh, in a uh, damaged ship. Yes, they actually uh hit something that Kirk calls a black star, not the TV show from the 80s. John Blackstar, astronaut, is swept through a black hole into an ancient alien universe. But the black star is an actual uh celestial event. It's a theoretical version or type like a black hole, but it's not a hole, it's a star. So it throws them back into a time warp uh, on their way back to Earth. But this actually gives them entree later towards the end to do time travel two other times in Star Trek. Can you think of at least one other time that you've seen them use the time travel effect in this episode at all? Well, I mean, later on, they slingshot around the sun, which is, of course, how they... Um, travel in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. That's correct. Uh, there is one other time. And also in Picard Season 2. No, please, that's not really a TV show. That's more a collection of noise. Uh, and, and They slingshot around the sun, buddy. I know, but it's not really Star Trek. But okay, the actual, I'm thinking, there's another original series episode coming up, which you'll see, and I'm sure you'll have a delightful reaction to. It's called Assignment Earth. It's a backdoor pilot that Roddenberry was trying to make. But again, it was with the slingshot effect. It's best seen, obviously, in Star Trek IV, the one with the whales. But uh, your initial impression of this, let me guess. Uh, if I can guess what your initial r- impression was. Please, Captain. May I? Yes. Let me see. Oh, God. What are we getting ourselves into? No, Is that close? L- no, I dig, sci- you know, I like time travel episodes. Time travel episodes are... Um, you know, uh, Star Trek standard. They happen in every series, essentially. And some of the best episodes are time travel episodes. I was just watching the other night. Uh, I had a horrific fever, ladies and gentlemen. Somehow I managed to catch both the flu and some sort of bacterial lung infection in May 2024. But I'm over it now. But um, Wash your hands. Star Trek is, of course, an amazing salve. Whenever you're going through a rough time in your life, either physically or mentally, and I was going through both with my fever dream, and I happened to put on Pluto TV, and it was a little gift from the cosmos because they were playing Trials and Tribulations, where the DS9 crew goes back in time to the Kirk era uh, Tribbles episode. And well, that's we, a th- th- that's not though going back to 1966 though. So no, but I'm just yeah. saying, good. I I I did not mind the time travel. When you are ready, Captain, I will get into, because there's another connection to Trials and Tribulations here. Let me get into it now. So Trials and Tribulations, for our Star Trek fans, opens with, um, like, Time Investigation Bureau coming to DS9 to investigate Cisco's excursion to the past. I guess it, it makes a lot of sense, because so many Federation ships travel through time that there would be some sort of, you know, 
private detectives, not private detectives, but official Bureau of Investigation to make sure they didn't screw up the timeline when that happens. And he says, we ran into Kirk and they were like, oh, my God, he is the worst. And my God, was Kirk the worst for the temporal prime directive? He was a madman in this episode. He instantly takes the person from the past onto a ship and starts explaining everything about the future. And then (laughs) says, oh, oh, right. I wasn't supposed to say any of that. I guess you have to stay here and forget about your kids. He's a madman this episode, Captain. There's a, there's a lot of weirdness in there. You're talking about your because you're jumping all over I the know, place. But DS nine's DS nine's thirtieth anniversary trials and tribulations. The thirtieth anniversary of Star Trek. That's when that came out. Trial, uh, trials and tribulations, which is uh, where they took the DS nine cast and they pretty seamlessly yeah. injected them into the episode Trouble with the Tribbles, which will come to later in season two, I believe. In this one. Yeah, it makes no sense. The Enterprise is being chased by the Interceptor. Kirk orders the the tractor beam on, even though they know it'll crush the Interceptor because it's small. And then he orders it beams on the guy on board the ship and gives him a grand tour. And we first see our there's women on the ship thing, but uh, there's also a better line when they get to the bridge. Why don't I just let the guy from the past see everything? (laughs) Now, you could say that maybe Kirk was like, well, we can't we have no way to get back. But uh, or they couldn't think of it at the time. But I do like the line they enter on the bridge where Captain Christopher says, I never really did believe in little green men. And Spock says, neither did I. That actually is one little line. I never have believed in little green men. Neither have I. Uh, It's a fine line. But Kirk, uh, the uh, very fine line between love and hate, they... Also had, uh, again, this is USPA. It's not the Federation. It's very odd that, the, you know, you had the last episode was the Federation and this one's USPA again. Right. So, Captain, figure. you know, uh, expound here. Was this was this shot out of order? Uh, no, this. Eh, no, it wasn't. I guess it's just bad editing. USPA is the United Earth Space Probe Agency, by the way. I mean. I don't, I can't understand it. But uh, they capture, you know, Captain Je- uh, Christopher, and then we go on the rest of our little weird, I guess almost like a sense of fair. Let's go take a tour of the Enterprise and explain the 23rd century to 20th century technology. You know, it's just uh, you start with the female computer, the fembot computer, and they're, they're right, disgusted weird. of how the computer giggles and... That's very weird. That's Majel Barrett, by the way. I'm, you know, as the more sexed up uh, computer. Computed and recorded, dear. Computer, you will not address me in that manner. Computer. Computed, dear. But I'm going to point out there's actually some good things in here. We actually see uh, Transporter Chief Kyle for the first time. He's in here. Who Lieutenant Leslie cares, uh, the- Captain? He comes in like 12 episodes. It's also the first uh, instance of replicators. That is true. I did notice that. Chicken soup. At the drop of your hand. Touch your hand. Can you believe it? It, It's right there. But, yeah, uh, I'm not really sure what else to say. They're trying to figure out how to get it back. I, You know, they're trying to figure out how to get him back. They want to take all the information. They're trying to hide the fact that they were in uh, atmosphere and they want to try and get back to the past. The ship is really messed up. But Scotty does say something, and I always find this bizarre. He says that he can fix the ship, but then where are they going to go? And if you really think about it, since humans are really at a basic stage of development, yet the rest of the universe is kind of growing up around us, why couldn't they fly the Enterprise to a future area you know if they were if they were really trapped they could have gone to vulcan for example yes they could have gone to telar or a- andoria well or anywhere maybe they didn't want to mess with the timeline but if they couldn't get back why would it matter <sighs> well well you know? just because they're not going just because you're not going to see the mess you make doesn't mean that they would want to make it um well that you know i guess I mean, uh, some other things you might have noticed on the bridge. The screens looked a little bit beaten up because they kept moving the sets around. I did not notice so that. So it was, 
if you take a look carefully, you'll see like there are bend marks in the paper, which is the computer screens and the top displays. After this, they actually put in actual computer-like displays or TV displays. Oh. Because the NBC said, let's uh, spend a buck because it looks like crap. Huh. So after these episodes, they began to spruce up the set. Um, I don't know. What did you think of uh, Captain Christopher as our guest star, Roger Perry, in this? Fine. <laughs> Living an ex- existential nightmare. The poor guy. <laughs> Um, now he actually liked this episode a lot. So. Yeah, no, 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 it was great. But again, Kirk is just being a madman. He he, he talks is. to Bones, I believe, about can we alter this man's memory so that way he doesn't remember his kids? What a psychopath! Wait, he, doesn't, he doesn't say alter his man's memories. He says, can he be retrained because he's archaic and he won't survive in our time? And if we do get back to where we belong, then he won't belong. We're roughly about the same age, but in our society. He'd be useless. A kick. But maybe he could be retrained, re-educated. Now you're sounding like Spock. If you're going to get nasty, I'm going to leave. But can he be retrained to forget his kids? And the captain says, That's no, I nuts. can't. That's crazy. Also, what about cross-referencing? Spock did a pretty sloppy job. He said, you uh, give no contribution to the future. Yeah, but I have my kids. Oh, yeah, kids. Uh-huh. Yeah. How okay. about just hit the plus mark next to the guy's name? It might give you, like, you know. Okay. I guess that's a Here's, pre-Google search. I, I, I'm looking at my notes here because, again, the problem is not that much happens in this episode. And, like, they keep on making bad choices, like the same bad choices. Oh, they beam up and they're not supposed to be there. They beam someone else up to the Enterprise who's not supposed to be there. They're getting interrogated. It's just a lot of, you know, wheel spinning as writers where it's like, okay, I can keep writing scenarios like that's the thing. I realized that when I was a kid, I was like, you know, 15 and it's like, okay, you got to write a a short story. that's 10 pages long. And you used to love writing short stories. But I remember that time I was not feeling particularly inspired. But I realized that if I just write a series of events, one thing to the other and don't care about it narratively fitting together, suddenly you have 10 pages. Suddenly they have a script that's 45 minutes cut and print. But anyway, there you go. Um, so well, I mean, this this go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm, I, I was rambling. This is, this, this is a good first attempt by DC Fontana. She'll see. She does other things later. She also has written books. I mean, I there are a bunch of weird things in there. Like, why would Kirk himself go down to the base to try and steal the information they need? Why would Sulu accompany him? Is another reason, question. It, you it, know, it's a little bizarre. It's um, just not that, very tight writing. Um, I'll I'll give you one thing that I did actually dig, right? Okay. When the, what was it, F-104? Yeah, the F-104 jets. When yes. the F-104 was heading towards the Enterprise, Spock makes a mistake, but it's a understandable mistake, where he says, hey, this thing has weapons on it. It could have nuclear missiles. Now, again, as a, you know, a person who's living now, we know that there are no F-104s, no fighter jets that were armed with nuclear warheads ever. That would have been a bomber, at you know, like in Dr. Strangelove. But that's the equivalent of you and me looking at someone from like, you know, the 14th century and say, "Ooh, you might have a poleaxe. Now, of course, to them, they're like, what are you talking about? Poleaxes don't come around for another 200 years. We're using swords and warhammers. But what's the... You know, you know what I mean? It's like, OK, vaguely, he might know this is an armed vessel. The, the country of origin at the time had nuclear weapons. Hence, it could have nuclear weapons. So I think that that was some smart writing by D.C. Fontana on that part where he made a mistake, but he made an understandable mistake. But you also have to understand that uh, there's something that everyone always forgets. When you go to regular Star Trek in the original series, it's a post-apocalyptic Earth. It's an alternate timeline, unlike Star Trek Discovery. Yes, I will always say that. It's not our timeline. It's a different timeline. A timeline where the world powers go to war in 1996. You have the Eugenics War and World War III and the ragtag remnants of humanity uniting together finally. Something new Star Trek has totally forgotten about. But... It is extremely possible that the that the uh, powers at the time have nuclear weapons because 
information was fragmented and falling apart, so the detailed information wasn't necessarily available to humans in the 23rd century. They have pieces here and there. So I could see Spock having that mistake. Also, the ship's messed up, so they may not be able to get enough information as to what's on there. Their senses are not working right. Their engines aren't working right. They're barely holding in orbit, or even getting to orbit is a big deal. Um, You think uh, impulse power is a quarter of the speed of light, so why does it take them 10 minutes to get out of orbit, uh, get into orbit? I mean, they do have thrusters, but the ship's heavy. And that it's damaged. So I would say that uh, I give a little break to Mr. Spock there. Yeah, no, I give a break to Mr. Spock as well. I think it was good writing, like a, a break. Right. But, but you know, not double-checking or cross-referencing Captain Christopher's offspring. Ah, you could have done a little better job there, Mr. Spock. That's true. Um, they have to go down to the military base to, because Captain Christopher reveals, you know, uh, that has all my pictures and audio Luckily, it's all in the same spot. So uh, Kirk and Sulu, for some reason, beam down to the military base, and they try and proceed to get their things with Sulu getting out and Kirk getting captured by MPs or Air Force uh, uh, security, I guess APs. Um, But uh, I don't know. That entire little, like, uh, punching scenes with the guards and so forth, I I saw was a little ridiculous. What did you think about that? Sorry. What? What do I think about what? When, when you know, when they're fighting each other, where, where Kirk is fighting uh, the Air Force security guards. I don't know. I just thought that was a, a kind of ridiculous. That whole that whole bit where he's going through the the base and he's suddenly captured by that hard nosed uh, colonel, saying, "I'm going to put you in jail for two hundred years." Actually, right. that's actually a funny line because he goes, "That is about right." But I am going to lock you up. For 200 years. That ought to be just about right. The scene where he's getting his butt handed to him by the security guards because for breaking into the base. Eh. Yeah, big eh. It felt like. I mean, honestly, Matt, I'm, yeah, that... I just watched this episode a couple of hours ago. I'm having a hard time remembering exactly what happens. Well, really not too much. I will tell you, they get in, they steal the stuff, Kirk gets away. It's revealed that Captain. Uh, Christopher's child eventually is Colonel Sean Jeffrey Christopher, who leads a historic uh, space probe to Saturn, a successful space probe to uh, Saturn. Yes. It's actually mentioned one other time. You would also think uh, Picard would mention it, your precious Picard. In Picard season two, TV when series. his great-great-great-grandmother goes to uh, Grand- Europa. Whatever. Yeah, that one, you know, maybe they'd mention that space probe. I mean, you know, that's the same episode where uh, uh, Patrick Stewart slowly gets uh, run over by a very light <laughs> Tesla. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it's a terrible episode. I, terrible. No. Oh, no. Yes. It was terrible. But Colonel Sean Jeffrey Christopher, the son who, uh, who of, of Captain Christopher, actually leads that space probe to Saturn. And the other two crew members are actually mentioned in Enterprise, and their names are Fontana and O'Hurley, oh. as in D.C. Fontana, and O'Hurley, who was the director of this episode. Um, so that's actually haha, I guess. Yeah, uh, there's really not much else really here I can think of. I mean, like the computer voice and how Kirk can't stand it being like all female-ish. Maintenance note. My recording computer has a serious malfunction. Recommended either be corrected or scrapped. Compute. Computed. We'll tell you that the Beach Boys' "Good Vibrations" was out that year. All right, let's uh, let's see what else could we talk about just down over here. I have I have to address this now because this is one thing in this episode I really cannot stand. Before we start recording, I said there's one thing I really oh, yes, cannot please. stand in this episode. What was that? So they figure out their time calculations to get back to the future, which, by the way, Spock does all in his head. That I like. Well, he does that, too, in, uh, in Star Trek Four. It is a fact, Doctor, that prowling by stealth is more time-consuming than a direct approach. In our case, a Shouldn't direct... you be working on your time warp calculations, Mr. Spock? I am. He, and he also, but he uses a computer. Eh, but here he does it all in his head. He does it the by thing... memory, they say. In fact, he says, I have to guess. 
Yes, but the one thing I really cannot stand. So how are they going to return the Captain Christopher, who Kirk captured because, you know, why not, and the security, the uh, MP (laughs) on the uh, Air Force base, they capture him because he happens to be nearby. So how do they return him? This entire sequence, they run around the sun, uh, which causes them to go into a time warp, and they're now back in time, and they're going to beam... Captain Christopher into the spot where they just took him out. So when they beam him there and they beam him out, he's beaming back in. It's all precisionally done, which is amazing. And yet somehow that erases his memory. The same thing with his security guard. I'm really not clear how that works, and I've never been. Maybe you can explain it, and I've seen this lots of times. It just never really works no, for me. No, they're, they're Did you figure- again, they just stopped writing. They were like, Okay, um, if we put him in back physically in the same place, that'll change his memory. It doesn't make any sense, and you've nope. seen that kind of some somewhat similar times in, um, like it reminds me of uh, Superman the motion picture when he reverses the oh. rotation of the Earth. Yeah, and everyone reverses. Yeah, just by going backwards. Right now, but that's a <laughs> yeah. thing. No one, I don't think that we're meant to believe that he rotates the spins around the earth makes the earth rotate back and that time reverses when the earth goes in the wrong direction and everyone's memory goes back it's supposed to be uh you know an impressionistic filmmaking technique of him flying through the time barrier right like flying so fast Mm -hmm. that he goes back in time um this is like you've got a visual of putting someone back in the same place and for some reason, you expect your audience to believe that it puts them, that it changes their memory, too. Yeah. It doesn't make terrible. any sense. It's terrible. Uh, I do want to add the slingshot effect around the sun and the remastered version, I think, looks fantastic, where they, they're zipping around the sun. I like yeah. that. That's all brand new. I actually like that effect. I mean, listen, you got to oh, understand. They're making a I, left turn. I love, I love the sequence in uh, mm-hmm. Star Trek Four. When they go around, when yes. they go and slingshot around the sun, it's beautiful. It's scary because they're not doing it in a big Constitution class ship. Um, they're just doing mm-hmm. it in a rusty old bolt, a uh, bag of bolts that is a an old Klingon warbird. Um, yeah, man. I and here it's just very anticlimactic. Oh wait, but I have other questions when you're now, ready. Sure. Well, let me just say I do like that scene. The original. <coughs> The uh the the original version they just had the they couldn't figure a way to do it they were going to say slingshot around the sun but they had a budget so they just showed the ship shaking up and down as a visual as if it was like vibrating really hard so this is like a massive upgrade but it, you're right it is anticlimactic it's like we're here now we're gone back right. it just eh and that's pretty much the story but go ahead let's ask your questions go okay. ahead. You've got questions. We've got answers. Yes. Um, so I did like that he dropped a line that there that this is one of twelve ships in the fleet. So there were only twelve Constitution yes. class fleet uh, ships. Was the Constitution class like the Galaxy class and the Sovereign class the top of the line flagship of the Federation at the time? Yes. Okay. That that's it, but it's twelve to start. There were more constitutions made later, and then you have the refits. But yeah, there are twelve constitution class ships, uh, all uh, with very U.S. Navy like names, kind of. And um, but has the Enterprise just always been the a name of a ship that's associated with flagships? Like whenever there's an Enterprise, no. it's implied that it's the top of the line. No, that's just because it's actually not the flagship here, but the uh, the Enterprise has made the flagship of the Federation after the five-year mission is successful. Uh, the 12 Constitution-class ships go on various adventures. You'll see what happens to several of them in the original series. You have uh, books that talk about the rest of them. Um, but uh, the reason why the Enterprise is considered the flagship is that when Kirk brings it back home, it's the one of the most storied and historic uh, adventure. In fact, something you will also notice in later episodes, each Constitution class has its own command patch. It's only after Kirk comes back that they all adopt that star. Huh. 
that cur- that the, we all know. That's the actual story behind it. So later you'll see the Constellation. You'll see people from the Exeter uh, and other ships, and they have different patches on them. And the re- idea was, is just like in the real Navy, each ship has its own naval uh, image type of thing in a patch, not the rank stru- not the rank structures. Uh, but uh, because Kirk did uh, a super cool job on his five-year mission, uh, they adopted the Enterprise's command star for all ships of Starfleet as an honor to their five-year mission. So there. Well. How's that? God bless. Does that answer your question, sir? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess. All right. Um, Next question. Was that a replicator? Yes, that is a replicator. Okay. It really is. It was the replicator in the transporter room, which uh, does not always stay in the tra- in the transporter room. It does make chicken soup. Uh, you might not think it's a big deal, but uh, Transporter Chief Kyle it was almost like Scotty's number two mm. in later episodes, so he does appear numerous times later, not just in a karate gi, but later in an enter- in a officer's uh, That's uniform. That's another thing. Which is the red shirt. They, they get this captain on there, and instead of putting him in civilian clothes or like a gi, uh, they put him in a captain's uniform. They put him in command gold. Or, What's going on here? Well, they put him in. Yeah, I, I was always wondering. The, yeah, but the, uh, Kirk says, God, take him to the quartermaster and put him in something more comfortable. I mean, at least it's not like that ugly, fluffy uh, shirt that Picard and Ensign Kim wore in Next Gen and Voyager, but or the pirate shirt Jerry Seinfeld wears. But I mean, no, no, they they have. When they've already established this, they already established what civilian clothes in the 24th century are, at least on, on TNG. Um, it's what Lore r- wore the first time but that, or what before war. But this is this is not uh, that it's this is 20 what Bolians wear. Yeah, no, I understand. I know, but they would be wearing the red. They'd be wearing the red gi. Wouldn't well, they? no, not necessarily. Other characters you'll find out later. Someone you'll know. His name is Khan Nudian Singh. Or actually, it's just called oh. Khan. He actually uh, wears a different kind of uniform type of thing. Yeah, it was a little weird. Why would you put him in something with a, a command stripe and, and uh, the star? It's like you, you ran out of clothing. But, by the way, the, uh, the actor said that he wanted to uh, take this shirt from his, the, the, the command gold shirt with him, and he asked D. Kelly, can I take my this shirt? And he goes, well, they frown upon that, so he never took it. And he said, I wish I had taken it. It would have been worth a lot if I did. <laughs> yeah, definitely should have asked for uh, forgiveness, not permission on yeah. that one. Um, OK, so again, there's not much on this episode, but I got another sure, question go for you, which I did kind of like. Yes. What's your theory on UFOs? Because I'll tell you why this did touch on a theory that is being espoused by ufologists today, including myself, which is that I don't believe that people who see you know, UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomenon, are crazy or lying, but I do not in any way connect that, make the logical leap to connect UAPs with, um, you know, uh, alien visitors. In fact, statistically, if you're really going to delve the, the, the darkest corners or the most far out corners of science fiction probability or possibility, it's much more likely that a UAP would be humans time traveling from the future than aliens. Well, that's interesting. Do you, you follow no, me? No, I understand it. It's possible. I, I, both could be possible. I mean, but if to get here in outer space, at least with our current understanding of technology, you really would need to have a huge undertaking to get here. You know, between shielding, it would be probably physically impossible. That's unless the thing. their science is so far advanced that it's no problem. I mean, there's book, countless books and movies all about that stuff. I mean, if you take a look, even at Independence Day, you have a huge, which is really not that wonderful. It's just got a lot of oh yeah, very scientifically advanced. Yeah, oh, yeah, but I mean, they have huge ships that could possibly make the distance in the in the TV series V. Uh, and V, the final uh, battle. I mean, they came all the way to Earth basically to seal water. Um, you know, in, in Ender's Game, it's organic life that somehow evolved in, into space. Uh, so it's possible. Is it likely? Well, from what we understand, no. Could it be time travel? I, it could. 
But again, how likely is that? And how much energy is in there? You would need to have a different understanding of sciences and so forth. It's just beyond us. So anything's possible. But, you know, Occam's razor says, what's the most likely, the, mo- the simplest explanation is the most likely? Is it possible that it's just some other stellar phenomenon that people notice? Or... No, I, I mean, I think that logically, because it, it, it seems to obviously have intelligence... Occam's Razor, which I'm a big fan of, as I'm actually quite the skeptical person by nature, Occam's Razor just says there's technology out there that we're not familiar with, that is advanced, that's not cla- that's not been declassified, um, and we're flying it around and testing it. And of course, we're not going to admit what it is. And also, it might not even be even be ours. It might be China's or Russia's or Iran's or North Korea's. Right. I mean, if North Korea took a billion dollars. It was like, okay, well, we're going to let our people starve, but we're going to put a billion or a trillion dollars towards making a better drone. Do you think they would tell us yeah, about it? They probably would just make a giant balloon and we'd send a multi-million dollar jet with, with $50,000 or shot missiles to shoot it down. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. That's so weird. Like a year ago this time, there were all these balloons getting shot down and all this you know, UAP is and now... No one's talking nope. about it. Well, that's, I'm telling you, know, you, you know, I don't believe in conspiracy theories, but weird stuff happens. In well, you place. know, we do live in a short attention span society. And, and you know, Occam's razor is good, but Harry's razors are actually not bad either. And, you know, maybe we can get a sponsor. <laughs> I like Harry's razors. <laughs> but I mean, personally, I use Harry's and a double edged razor. That's what I use. But anyhow, I know you like to be all rough. I use the free razors from Equinox. Oh, wow. Look at you. You're Mr. Fancy there. Going to Equinox Gym, well, you know. I gotta. I, well, if you're gonna pay for Equinox, you gotta save money any way you can. <laughs> well, that's why you know everyone should go buy T-shirts to help support the channel. Uh, you have any other questions oh, God, on uh, on this episode? Or no? No. I mean, listen. You got to take the sweet and the sour. I love Arena. Love Squire of Gothos. I liked Galileo I Seven. Think you secretly loved, uh, I think you secretly love. I think you secretly love Miri and uh, what are little girls made of, especially for that uh, special. St- I hate those. Episodes. You love that special stalagmite. Admit it. <laughs> uh, I do not, and I will not, and that's slander. Nope. Yeah. Long story short, everyone. Yeah. <sighs> there are going to be some stinkers out there. Listen. There are stinkers of my beloved TNG and DS9. Yeah, no, there's stinkers in everything. Um, but I will tell you, though, um, I do like uh, uh, Ed Peck, who is the hard-ass colonel. By the way, he had his own TV show that was on before that, and it was canceled. But yeah, I just like his voice but uh, as the hard-ass. But, yeah, there's really nothing here. I guess maybe we should just uh, wrap this up, and then you can tell me any other exciting stories that are going on in your life besides being sick as a dog for a week. You're always getting sick. Stop Eesh. licking the floor. That's your first thing. And then we'll also talk about upcoming no, I episodes. I mean, you know what? I, I was reading about this. I do a tremendous amount of cardio. Mm-hmm. And uh, apparently folks who do a lot of cardio, like, you know, intensive running on a on a treadmill every day, um, are more prone to uh, upper respiratory infections. Yeah. I like so. sitting on couches, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I do cardio as well. I'm get you to the gym, Captain. Oh no, I've actually lost forty eight pounds, so I'm actually doing pretty well. I know. Anyway, but uh, I know you look great. Thanks for. And much. he wasn't fat to begin with, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. He just went from merely slightly chubby to now quite fit. That's I just right. I'm some fit as a captain. fiddle. I can run up and yes. down the stairs in a single bound. But anyway, uh, See, this is why I want to do a video show because we're a couple of good looking guys here, and uh, you know I, there are a lot of Star Trek podcasts out here. I don't think they've got our sex appeal. <laughs> well, we'll see. That's all I'm saying. We'll tell all 250 of you at the present time what we look like eventually. Um, so let's uh, go up to our final thoughts. Do uh, you want to go first on this? or um, Fine concepts that surprisingly, I mean, the slingshot effect uh, <laughs> has a surprising uh, long-lasting influence on Star Trek. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, underwritten... Not that entertaining, uh, kind of weird in places, and damaging to, I dare say, a damaging episode. Because when you've got an episode that is inconsistent and writing about, and, you know, basically 
having your main character being Kirk be really, really dumb, <laughs> that's a problem. So what are you going to give this on our scientific 1 to 10 scale? <sighs> um, Not as annoying as Miri or Shoreleave, but as underwritten as Miri and what little girls are made of. So I'm going to go 4 out of 10. Wow. Well, for me, I actually am not a big fan of this episode either. I do not like having the United States Air Force footage at the beginning. Not not that I have anything against the U.S. Air Force. Yeah, wait, why didn't you like that? I just It just doesn't feel like it matches Star Trek. I remember the first time I saw this, I thought it was another show on originally when I very first saw it. Um, I just I was not interested. I knew that wasn't a real jet fighter or cockpit that Christopher's sitting in in the beginning. I know, suspension of disbelief. I do like the uh, uh, Enterprise in the atmosphere, both the original and the new one. I love the sl- slingshot effect here. Uh, I don't like that beaming thing, as I've already told you. Uh, there are a couple of nice quips between uh, the characters, like about how you could see about uh, Spock uh, actually getting things wrong and McCoy being insulted, being referred to as Spock. But overall, it was kind of like, uh, so why are we doing this exactly? You know, it almost was meaningless. Um, There are so many other ways that I think they could have handled it. Um, Not that I'm the greatest writer in the universe, but uh, I do like the idea that they're fixing the ship. They could have actually gone anywhere. But for me... I'm going to give this a 5 out of 10. I really just did not like it. Uh, it's it's just okay enough to meet the halfway point of being like, it's got some couple of nice things in it. It's better than Miri. It's, it's better than Shore Leave. It's definitely better than Mel- Mud's Women. But uh, it's, just, it's just not doing it for me. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. I will tell you, you might actually like the next episode that's coming on up. It's uh, called Court Martial. It's a trial episode, uh, something we both know about. Like today, you and I, we could have gone to trial against each other. That's right, boys and girls. Oh, yes, we were on opposite sides of the aisle today, believe it or not. That's right. It was Matt versus Mike. Actually, it wasn't. We had it settled in advance. Sorry, everybody. Yes, (laughs) sorry. But it does happen. You guys don't understand. In the best of circumstances, it's better for all parties, clients, and attorneys, judges, and legal system when parties settle. Yeah. And uh, that's what we did. Yeah, that's what we did. Besides, you know, then we grabbed a cup of coffee. Mike went on his way, and I went back to the office. It was, uh, you know, that's the way lawyers are. Um, but Two uh, best friends. Two best friends who will destroy each other at the slightest provocation. Not really. Well, speaking of which, I want to tease. I'm going to convince Matt that we're going to do a video episode. I'll do it. And we are going to go through our fantasy crew and ship. And then we're going to have perhaps a third-party arbitrator, or maybe we're just going to be very honest with each other. You mean we're drinking. To determine who, yes, who would win when our fantasy bridge crews and ships. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a little hint. I will be, strangely enough, choosing the Voyager as my ship. And Matt, your ship is? Ah. Uh. As my main hero ship? Yes. That's a tough one. You already told me it. I well, I really like the uh, original Connie, the 1701, Kirk's Enterprise. I like it. You, uh, you he's revisionist I, history, everyone. Okay, he Enterprise E. Like, I liked Enterprise yes. E, but, you know, but I actually kind of, I like them all. But, uh, he Voyager likes that big, kick, ugly warship. It's, I, I just like it because it's purdy. On the, it's not ugly. It does look like it was stepped on, but I actually uh, like the original Constitution the best. Voyager would kick the Constitution's butt, I think. That's my opinion, because it's more advanced. Well, I don't know. With Janeway well, inside, she'd I've, probably I've murder half my, her crew. Well, I'm not using Janeway as my captain. <laughs> I've got my reasons, which we will explore, as to why I dug Voyager. Not my favorite, but I think it's kind of the most practical if I'm going to run a ship. Well, it does make sense, except for those bioneural gel packs and Leola root stew. But that's, uh, you know, that's only if you're stuck in the Delta Quadrant. I actually have true. I actually have all the Galoob mini spaceships, so maybe we could use that as... Uh, oh, as yeah. Send, Please, yeah. send me pictures. Oh, I got tons of them. Maybe I'll put some on, on our community tab as long as stuff for our next episode, too. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much anything else you want to talk about, Mike? Besides uh, you getting better? All right. Well, then, 
I get- I'm glad to be better. I look forward to this. I'm sad that it was uh, delayed due to my illness, but yeah. I'm glad that we're doing it now on a beautiful Thursday night. It sure is. And we'll get this out to everyone as soon as possible. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Yelling at Gaseous Anomalies. And don't forget... Uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to Yelling at Gaseous Anomalies. You can email us at yellingatgas at gmail.com or find our Facebook page at Yelling at Gas, or you can find us on all your local podcasters. And don't forget to go to our Tea Public Tea uh, Shirt store and buy some merchandise. We need Help. that latinum. We need latinum to make the, make the podcast grow. And we thank you for subscribing, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Yelling at Gaseous Anomalies. Live long and prosper, and see you out there. Night, Mike. Good night, Captain. All right, Thanks, take care, everyone. everyone. Live right. long and prosper.